Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. We're bringing the best and the brightest from the world of business, marketing, and personal growth and laundromats to help you harness your new tenacity and drive your career forward. Folks, I'm excited for this one. I was just talking to my guest, Dave Menz, a minute ago. And there, there, there's some guests that I reach out to because they're in my you know, HR talent acquisition world. There's some I, I just admire their journey, and Dave is of the latter here. And he is an author, a podcaster, a business owner, and the laundromat millionaire. So his story real quick, going up in poverty, Dave worked his way up from an entry-level job in corporate America, but was left wanting more. And he decided, pardon me, to start his own business and eventually found a laundromat for sale on Craigslist that he decided to go all in on. We're going we're gonna to get into that story in a minute there. I think, I think it was the same story in Shameless. You watch Shameless? I think she bought a laundromat, but I digress yeah. there. And Dave purchased <laughs> a business that was losing money and through grit created something that was not only profitable but also vertically integrated. And we're going to explain that concept to everybody. Today, Dave preaches a good word of the laundromat business and stands by his belief that it's the best small business in America. Let's find out why. Dave Menz, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Adam, thanks for having me. And I got a quick question for you. Can I call sure. you the pause? Is that, is yes, that you can. Do no, people it works. call you the pause? Is that like the Fonz? Uh, so, I mean, listen, <laughs> I, t- I mean, I tell the story all, all the time. I mean, my, my name, my last name is Posner, but it's also pronounced Posner. To some folks, and gotcha. um, instead of correcting them, you know, when I was little, people just call me pause and pause doesn't work. It's pause. stuck, huh? Yeah, it was. So, nice. enough about me. Enough about me. Thank you, you for having me. Pause. I appreciate it. Yeah, let's get to it. I'm excited I'm here. So, let's bring everyone kind of up to speed here. And, you know, tell us about growing out, you know, without much and, and how that mm-hmm. prepared you in the business sense. I mean, were you that kid that was hustling and, you know, doing the newspaper route and selling candy at school? Like, how did you get that entrepreneurial bug? You know, I don't know how I got it. And I, I'm actually, the older I get, the more fascinated I am with how I got to where I am. Because um, I, I really don't, I mean, I can tell you the story, but I don't know. All I know is that I have an entrepreneurial spirit, let's call it that, from the day I was born. And the funny thing is, I wasn't raised by entrepreneurs. Um, I didn't really even know any. I was just fascinated by all things business and entrepreneurship. And as I learned about how businesses serve their communities mm-hmm. and uh, and provide a living for their for their owners, and quite frankly, sometimes a nice living, uh, comfortable living. It was just fascinating to me that wait, I can. I was always raised my faith. I was raised to serve others. That's that's the way I was raised. And I always said, wow, I can do both. Like I can wow. I can have my cake and eat it too. What a cool life. It is. It so is, it really wasn't any more than that. Yeah, it, it is a cool life. And 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 real quickly, your parents were they were they were they business mm-hmm. folks? Were they educators, service people? What did they do? Yeah, my dad, uh, my mom and dad got married their senior year of high school and had my younger brother before they were 18 years old. Um, so we talk about starting out behind the eight ball. And I was a second child two years later. So by the time they were 19, they had two or 20, I guess. Uh, they had two kids and they were in, we were living in pretty extreme poverty. We were living in my grandparents' basement. Yeah. And if not for that, I'm not sure where we would have been living, to be honest. Um, but yeah, my dad was a grinder like me, not an entrepreneur, but a stubborn man who was going to take care of his family no matter what it took. And he went from that beginning and uh, created basically a career from him some, himself in the IT field. And the crazy thing is, this is back in the 70s. When right. IT Let's talk about exist. what IT looked like. It was main, yeah. mainframes and yep, word exactly processors. Right. And, you know, I'm yep. going to date myself here. I mean, I learned to type on an actual typewriter before even word processors. So we're not too. too far off, right? Yeah. Yep. So he, he, my dad grinded really hard. My mom, for the most part, was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, taking care of the kids because they eventually had my my younger sister and we had three kids and they were still very young and trying to figure out life. And uh, and that's why I say we you know, my childhood, the majority of my childhood, we were behind the eight ball financially. Uh, my parents were good people who loved each other very much and worked hard, but we just never had enough. Um, I you know, when when we talk about poverty, I always say. 
we put this caveat in there that there are people that had much worse upbringings than me. Um, so I'm not here to, to throw some story um, or, or make some spin or something like that. I'm just here to be authentic and say who I am. But we grew up really poor. And the reality is I was that little entrepreneurial bug. And it's a good thing that I was because I didn't have a lot of what I wanted. Or I didn't have anything of what I wanted yeah, really and very little of yourself. what I needed. Right, That's right. And so, so what it did is it ingrained in me from probably the age of two or three uh, if I remember right, that if I want something, I better go figure out a way to get it because nobody's going to hand it to me. No. And I tell you what, if anyone in life could have a life lesson burned into their psyche at a young age, that would be the one I would choose. Yeah, let's, pa- let's pause on that one for a minute. So I'm very that. grateful for that, even though it sounds like a sob story. But when you talk to me and get to know me, that's actually the, the I actually worry about my boys. I really, I have 11 and 14 year old boys. Do, do, They've grown like, up very you soft. Like you, you feel like, I, well, let's talk about that for a second here. Like as, yeah. a, as a parent, <clears throat> there, there's a balance, right? Cause you want to be able to give your kids everything and able, you yep. want to set them up for success. But at the same time, you, want, you don't want them to be too soft. You want them to know what a hustle feels like. You know, you want them to be able to fail and give them some water of a safety net, but, but know what it feels like to hit the ground. Yep. I mean, we all my wife that. and I, my wife and I talk about this all the time, and she grew up a very middle class, uh, comfortable life, but you know, very middle class. She wasn't necessarily spoiled, and I grew up the way I grew up. And I tell her all the time, I'm like, my, our boys are they're great kids. They're very well behaved mm. and good in school and all that stuff. But I wonder sometimes, man, is is actually the things that drive me are taking care of my family and making sure my children never experience what I experienced as a child. And then there's times where I'm starting to self-reflect at 45 years old. And I'm like, wait a second, that's made, that's what made me who I am. Am I doing them a disservice? It's a bizarre dichotomy. It, it, it is. It but, really I, is. I, but I also think that we're doing something subconsciously that is so much more powerful. Um, we're leading by example mm. and we're showing them. And I have these moments of reflection and my daughter's nine. And, you know, I built this business four years ago around her. And I incorporate her into it. I mean, these are her initials. This is her business. This is my legacy here. And I make it a very strong point, like to involve her and tell her what I'm doing at work and what I'm building and how I'm doing it. And she's seeing her dad and she's at the age of nine where she gets it. And she's seeing her dad build a business and, and, and fend for himself and struggle and work hard. And, and I also involve her in the content creation. She, she do my TikTok videos right now. My nine year old is doing my, you know, is doing my TikTok. So, you know, leading by example, I think is, is really, in my opinion, you know, a huge component of, of how we're raising our kids. You mm-hmm. want to give them the safety net. You also want to create an environment where they can fail in, mm-hmm. in, in a safe way. And it's, it's a tricky one. So, you know, let's get back to your career here. I mean, um, corporate America. Tell us about your, your early days in corporate America before you got into the Lord's Mac game. Yeah, so I barely graduated from high school. Congratulations, me. I think I was in a class of 250, and I think I was in the bottom 40 uh, in my class. Um, Very CD student. Uh, Just didn't like school, enjoyed socializing, but didn't do well in it. And so when I graduated from high school, between my parents not having a lot of money and me being terrible at school and, quite frankly, not even wanting to go to college. It's not a good recipe, man. um, It wasn't. It wasn't. (laughs) And I did a year of community college, and I actually did really well, which surprised me. But it it reinforced that I basically hated school. And so (laughs) what I did is at 19 years old, I got a job, an entry-level job at the local telephone company here in Cincinnati. Um, and over the course of 17 years, worked my way up. I was promoted five or six times in that time frame, and ended up at the end of my career making a really nice middle-class life for my family. And then somewhere in that 15 to 17 year gap, I had this kind of aha moment, like, wait, you're a, and I would say, I looked in the mirror of myself one morning as I'm getting ready for work. And I said, you're a sellout. Why? And what I meant, and my, what I meant by that was that two, three-year-old that I told you about earlier, mm-hmm. I was born to be an entrepreneur. I'm not real sure how that works. I don't know how it got in my soul, but I am meant to be an entrepreneur. And I had fought that. I had sold out for that middle-class lifestyle. And I woke up one day and said, you know what? This is not what you're on earth here to do. The money doesn't matter. The lifestyle doesn't matter. I was had a very comfortable living. I could have just coasted for 20 years and retired. But this isn't what I'm here to do. And so do I you, just had this aha moment. Do you remember when and where that was, that aha moment? I do. It was in my bathroom and I was getting up at 5 a.m. to go to work. And I literally looked at myself in the mirror and I literally was like, you're a sellout. What the hell, what the hell am I doing? You yeah. know, it's, it's interesting that moment too, because we're, we're kind of programmed from an early age. You know, we're roughly the same age. I'm, I'm 42, you're 45. So mm-hmm. we're in the same kind of world where like we saw our parents get up, go every day, work for mm-hmm. them. And entrepreneurial, working for yourself wasn't really a thing. 
You know, I look back on my career, you know, it took me 15, 16 years, 17 years before I went out on my own. But mm -hmm. I knew I always had it in me. And I knew in so many jobs, I knew deep down inside that I just didn't like working for other people. Mm -hmm. Right. There was this thing and I didn't know what it was at the time. And, and maybe it was a weakness. Maybe it was an attitude adjustment. I, I didn't know what it was. But now looking back and I'm like, shit, you know what? That was this bug inside of me that, you know, I needed to, to do something. So you have this aha moment and like walk us through the process. Cause I don't think we talk about this enough and I'm sure. And hopefully you do talk about it in your book coming out soon. I do. By the time, yeah. by the, time the show airs, a book will be out. So we'll do a proper promo at the end. Um, yes, thank you. That process, when you had that moment in the bathroom where you said, I'm a sellout, I don't want to be doing this, was it Was it like, okay, am I going to walk away from this thing immediately? Mm. I have some financial security, I'm going to figure it out, or like, let me figure it out the next move. And this is before the the, the laundromat bug even got into your head, correct? Yes, absolutely. All right, that so, was so, actually so, so walk us through this, right? So let's, yeah. walk, let, let's really unpack this moment yeah. here to I'd show people to. that this isn't like, shit, I'm done, I'm out. Mm -hmm. It isn't like the big Jerry Maguire moment, you know, we're no. not just, walk us through it, Dave. I appreciate that because if there's anything in my message <clears throat> that's important to me, it's this. So thank you, Adam. Yeah, what what basically happened is I had that aha moment. And so once again, the kid in me was like, well, nobody's nobody's going to come and hand me anything. Nobody's going to give me a different life, a different way. So I got to figure this out. That evening, I had a conversation with my wife, who's an incredibly supportive person and living your dream. And your dream can be different than mine and mine different than hers. Right. And she's very supportive in that way. And she was like, you know, I remember you telling me when we were dating that owning a business and being a business owner was something was important to you. And she said, you know, I think you're being a little harsh on yourself by saying you're a sellout. But at the same time, I, I understand where you're coming at it from. And so if you're serious about this, let's do something about it. And so we sat down and had a conversation and we said, you know, the interesting thing is I had worked for, I think at that point it was probably 14 or 15 years in corporate America. We had a nice life, uh, but we were pretty much paying the bills. We had a small savings account that could get us by for six, six months, but yeah, we didn't really have any money. And I, I didn't really know of the world of building a business without money. Um, everything I had ever studied and read was always like retail business associated. Um, so you needed seed capital is my point. Right. And so I looked at her Excellent. and I said, you know, we have a, we have a little bit of cash, but not much. And we wouldn't want to burn that up because that's our emergency fund. So long story short, Adam, for the next four to five years, we lived below our means. I kept my full-time job. We cut our lifestyle, not drastically. Um, and what we really did is focused on increasing our income. So you had a plan. Um, Absolutely. That was our plan for a four to five year period of time was to keep on keeping on. It was the opposite of the uh, the the scenario you mentioned in Jerry McGuire right. where you're just like, I'm out of here. It was yeah. a total opposite. Of that. I was like, we need a plan and we need to execute this plan. And so four to five years, she worked on increasing her income. I worked on increasing mine. We kept our lifestyle very low. We cut our lifestyle in some small ways. Um, what the, what and we lived thing, what, type of, what type of things did you cut that were like Kind of important to you. What were some of those sacrifices? You know, was it, like, was it make... was maybe like a, the occasional, like, you know, one extra dinner mm -hmm. with friends and like, you know, you know, you go out to those restaurants and you want yeah. to celebrate yourself and your success and, and loosen up a little bit. Next thing you know, you know, it's a $350 dinner tab. You're like, shit, that adds up quickly a few times mm -hmm. a month. Well, the good thing for us is we didn't have much of a lifestyle. We were just kind of getting started with our marriage and we had a young family and a baby at home and things like that. And so what we really did more than anything is focused on increasing our income. And as we did, we didn't um, we didn't increase our lifestyle accordingly. We were around the age of 28 to 29, I would say. And that's a lot of times where us middle class families with the white picket fence and 2.3 kids. That's uh, we, you know, yeah, we go from a two thousand dollar paid for car to a thirty thousand dollar minivan or SUV. We go from a two bedroom apartment that's comfortable um, or, or a very modest single family home to a really nice three thousand square foot home. And we just hadn't done those things. And we probably would have in the next few years mm -hmm. if this aha moment had it happened. And so a lot of it was just like delayed gratification. A lot of it was sacrificing. As our income went yeah. up, our lifestyle didn't change. And it was so funny smart. because our friends, and, and I don't mean this in a bullying way, but our friends would pick on us because they knew that, you know, we were around the same age, big social circle, and they mm -hmm. would, you know, upgrade from that you know, like I said, starter home to a really nice home and they would upgrade to that really nice vacation. And, and we just kept doing what we were doing, but they knew I got promoted. They knew she got her master's degree. They knew that we were making more money than ever. Okay. And all they knew is we were saving for our future. We were saving for our business. And so they were just like, what are you doing? So you're, you're, you're going down the path and you're starting to research ideas and, and, and 
were you looking at like franchises? Were you looking at other kind of, you know, positive kind of cash flow generating businesses? Where did the first spark of London that's coming to your mind? Wow, those are two questions. <laughs> uh, well, the that's first... the thing with being a podcast host that I learned early on. You want to give a two parter. Mm-hmm. Don't yeah, you, I may get, you may get the triple play. I mean, I, I pull that. I, <laughs> I, that's 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 a good pitch. Yeah. No. The, the the first answer to your first question is um, yes. I looked at everything. I I have an obsessive personality, and if I'm in, I'm all in. And there was, I, I didn't. One thing about business for me is I did not care about the product. I didn't even care about the industry. I cared about the act of owning a business, serving my community and making a better lifestyle for my family. And I didn't care how I got there. I mean, there was a few I was going to stay away from, you know, obviously legal and ethical things, moral things, things like that for mm-hmm. me were off limits. But short of that, at the, the kitchen sink. It wasn't going to be Dave's topless car wash, right? Probably not. Probably right. not. Okay. Just making sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so what I ended up doing is I ended up looking for that entire five-year period of time where we were saving up money. You know, we were saving up roughly $600 a month to give you an idea. That's that how up. much extra we could squirrel away. So roughly every year we had an extra seven or $8,000 in the bank. And we had started with a little bit. So one year one, year two, year three, every year I would just look at, I would look at businesses for sale within our budget. And we knew we were going to need to borrow some money, but if you knew one, okay. we had, smart money. Yeah. If we, if we knew in year one that we had $6,000 cash seed money to put down on a business, then I was looking for businesses that were in that range of 30, 40, $50,000 where I could borrow some, put this money down in year two, I doubled that year three, I tripled that. And it was in year five when I found this local laundromat for sale, we had at this point, probably about 30 to $35,000 in cash set aside, aside from our personal emergency fund. And yeah. So, so let's, let's, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but let's talk, mm-hmm. let's talk about the business of laundromats here for any, for most people, how, yeah. how a laundromat is, is, is operating. So correct me if I'm wrong here. So you're going to be leasing space. You have the machines. Correct. You have to lease the machine. Most people lease the machines, correct? No, most people buy the machines. Most people buy the machines, correct? Mm-hmm. So walk they, us through the economics of why a laundromat makes sense from a business perspective. Yeah. Talk us through the economics <clears throat> of a laundromat, like a one-off. I'm not even talking about a chain yet. Yeah. Well, with, with, I'll, I'll speak about mine, if that's okay. So with my, well, I would and, hope so. I mean, you're the, you're the laundromat millionaire. I'm not the laundromat millionaire. I'm not even the podcast millionaire. So please. Yeah. With, uh, with, with the first one that we found, we found it for sale on Craigslist and there are just be, to be clear, there are $2 million laundromats out there that are the Taj Mahal of laundromats. I've seen them. There's one around the corner are, from me. Listen, it's yep. like a shopping center. It's gorgeous. Yep. They have a lounge, they're a coffee amazing. shop, you know, they're beautiful because it's an they're, experience, which we'll get to in a little bit. Yep. They're absolutely amazing. Uh, This was the opposite of that. (laughs) It was a local laundromat of the suburbs of Cincinnati. It was at a, for the suburbs of Cincinnati, a fairly rough area. Um, And, uh, and it was a dump, to be honest with you. It was a complete and utter dump. 80% of the equipment was out of order. There was homeless people living in there, not hanging out, but literally living there. There were people doing drugs, selling drugs in the open. The police were there 10, 15 times a day. And I thought, what an opportunity. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you could see the diamond in the rough, my friend. I could, and my wife was terrified. <laughs> I want to go in there to but, clean it up. Yeah, she was like, when I took her to it, she was. I was like, what do you think? She was like, I think I want to leave. <laughs> but once again, having grown it up, grown it up in a rough area in Flint, Michigan, I had you know seen a lot and done a lot, and in the suburbs of Cincinnati were nothing. So no matter what was happening out there, it didn't intimidate me. Right. And uh, real quickly, what happened is I, I saw that it was in our budget. It was, I think it was for sale for $85,000. And Including I think the property okay. or was it a lease property? No, this was lease. Yeah, this was in a small shopping center. So you're center. just buying the business. Mm-hmm. That's right. And everything I was buying was the business, school. which by the way, was losing money. And most of the equipment inside was in terrible shape of disrepair. Um, but what I did do is before I closed on the property, and this was an evolution of three or four months, but before I closed on the property, I found an amazing mentor. Um, in Cincinnati, I started contacting local equipment distributors in my market in Cincinnati. And I would have them out and I would say, tell me what you think. Like, I know business. I've been studying business my whole life, read thousands of books. I feel like I know business. But you didn't well. know laundry mats. And that's right. I didn't know machine. anything about laundry mats or especially the equipment. Do you do your own laundry I, at home though? Do you know like actual laundry? Um, I know laundry for sure, but I don't, I haven't done laundry in four years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I did too. 10 loads yesterday. <laughs> Oh yeah. See, you need, anyway, a, you need to we, pick up a delivery service. <laughs> but uh, yeah, long story short, the, st- the business was for sale for 85,000. It was losing money. Um, so a lot of people would say that a business that's losing money is worth what? Zero. 
It's not worth anything. But I saw the opportunity. That's really what I bought. In the real estate world, they call it value add. Uh, but I saw the opportunity. I looked at all the laundromats for sale within a 20, or I'm sorry, all the laundromats in existence within a 20 mile radius of this store. And all nine of them were complete and utter dumps. This is a community I grew up in. I had lived there in Cincinnati since the sixth grade. Um, and so I knew the area, I knew the community, I knew the location was a good location. And I knew that there was people that needed a, what I call now a modernized laundromat. Mm -hmm. And between that and this new relationship I found with what ended up being a mentor of yeah, mine. Yeah, let's get back to that. Um, yeah, we, we, he met me at the space. I said, hey, I think this is a good location. I've lived here my whole life. Is it a good location for a laundromat? He said, it's an amazing location. And I said, what about this equipment? This all looks terrible. And he walked me through it. We spent, quite frankly, several hours in there. The first time I met him, um, didn't charge me anything. I had just an amazing heart of someone that wanted to help me. And I just saw a mentor in him. And so I invested in that, <clears throat> in that relationship. I lot of, spent a lot of time with him. And he walked me through the process of every machine in there. I said, what about these machines? What about these machines? And literally, he was like, yeah, those are garbage. Uh, those are great. Uh, those are, you know, half their life cycle is left. Mm -hmm. And it was honestly a hodgepodge. Probably half the equipment in there was pretty much worthless. But the place was doing such a small amount of business that the half that was working was really all I needed because I didn't have much business to start with. So pause on that. Let's talk about the mentorship for, for a moment here. Did he turn yep. into your your business partner, your, your vendor for you? Did he turn, you know, was he your, yes. your go-to? So he invested. Absolutely. I mean, think about that from a business perspective. He saw something yep. in you and what you were he doing. Did. And while, yes, you're developing a professional friendship, as I like to call them. I mean, it's also mm -hmm. a business relationship. So he was investing back into it, and there's a big ROI on that. So yep. when looking at this equipment there, if we're talking about the economics of, of a laundromat, especially in those early days, like how much how much did you have to invest back in to get this thing operational? Let's talk about building up that first store to, mm -hmm. to make it feasible and profitable. Yeah, when we first bought the store, our first goal was to get everything in the store working, even though I knew some of it was garbage equipment. And they have a service department with six technicians that have been working on commercial laundry equipment for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so they, they weren't cheap, but I said, I want your two best guys out at the store the day we close. And I want everything in here working no matter what it costs. And that was the first step in the right direction. Then I started what I call taking out the trash. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, my former career as a bouncer when I was younger uh, <laughs> came in really handy in a, <clears throat> in a lifestyle in Flint, Michigan. And so I let everybody know within a matter of a week or two that there was a new sheriff in town. And yep. all of a sudden, they just scurried like little roaches. You just and they, them out. Don't, they don't, want, they don't yep. want to be troubled. You know, no, they, they honestly, did. look at these are people just looking they for did. shelter and they were opportunists. Yep. The druggies yep. and the drug dealers, it was an opportunist, right? And they yep. don't want the hassle. Yep. And they'll find that's somewhere exactly else to go. They right. scatter like roaches to somewhere else. Yep. It's my that's house. Exactly. Get the hell out. Yep. That's mm -hmm. right. And that's exactly what happened. So we had to change that environment. Then we physically cleaned the store. The store was disgusting. We physically cleaned the store. Sweat equity to a level you cannot imagine. I, I can't. We, we painted. We re-drywalled. We put up some TVs. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money at that 30, 35,000. I told right, you about so you're we doing it yourself, up, man. You're doing it yourself. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of sweat equity. We got all the equipment working. And the cool thing is, Adam, it, within about three months, we had the place profitable and it was losing money when we bought it. And I was probably making after paying all these bills, service bills, parts, the whole nine yards, rent and everything. I mean, we we're probably making $1,500 a month profit. Why, and, why, why is it, why is the laundromat? Like, is it because of, is it, I don't want to say low low employee overhead? I mean, how many, how many mm -hmm. folks you have working at the laundromat at, at a time? Well, it, what, it depends. There's a couple different models well, out this, there. Right. This, there's just self-service kind of models. And yeah. There's more full service, right? right? There's more Correct. drop, drop, hold, wash, all that kind of stuff. Right. Correct. And that's, I, that's my evolution. That's my story in my book. Yeah. Laundromat millionaires that I evolved through the industry to the top of the industry. But yeah, the, the, the business I bought was what they call an unattended laundromat which is part of the reason that a lot of the things that were happening in there were happening. Yeah, and I had a full-time job. I couldn't quit my job. Yeah. Once again, I kept it for five years. And so I would go to work, you know, I'd go by the store. It was open 24 yeah. hours. I would go by the store in the morning, clean up, throw out all the, you know, people that didn't belong in there. Yeah. And then I would go to drive an hour to work, go to work. I climbed telephone poles for a living. So I was literally the guy, you know, hanging yeah. off the telephone poles, fixing the phone lines. And when I got off work, I would go straight to the laundromat and I would clean up and straighten up for the day. Mm -hmm. And then usually that evening before I went to bed, I would go back after my kids went to bed and, mm -hmm. uh, it, and clean up again just to make sure that it was okay overnight. And that was my life for four or five months as we got it to profitability. And it was really nothing more than nowadays what I call a commodity. Um, it was a, you know, you mentioned when we were talking offline, a laundry room. And, and it was really nothing more than that. It was a room with washers and dryers that was clean and safe. And that's all it was. And, and that's that's the start. That's the beginning. That's where you start. 
and back then was it was it was a coin operator? This is before we got into the mm-hmm. the card business, right? With yep, the, the it was card quarter, operated so, on quarters. So you, so you were unloading the machines. You were walking around. It was with like like Santa Claus, the bags of quarters there, right? Like Scrooge McDuck. Yep. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Any any anybody ever try to like you know jack you outside the store there? You know that's <laughs> something that a lot of people worry about, and um, you know, I've I'm how do I say this? Say I'm it. aware. I'm aware of my surroundings. Situational awareness, I, we call situational it. Situational awareness. And I, I'm not a you know Navy SEAL or anything like that, but I you grew up rough yourself. and you, you learn some things. And I worked at a nightclub for a couple of years, so you learn some things there about security. And, you know, let's be honest. I mean, I'm a pretty pretty big dude with a bald head and pretty broad shoulders. Yeah, no so, one's messing I mean, with you. So, I mean, if you're going to pick a fight with somebody, you're probably not going to pick it with me just based on my look alone. Right. So the answer to the question is no, I've never had a Good. problem. <laughs> but I do know tons of people in the industry that have. Yeah, it's it's you know? it's, it's, it's a tough one, man. So I mean, yeah. why laundromat versus a convenience store, bodega, mm-hmm. um, a, a Dunkin' Donuts franchise? Yep, great question. Two reasons. One, this was the only business that I could find that was in my wheelhouse as far as I needed. I had two things. One, it had to be in my financial ability because we only had thirty five thousand. Yeah, franchises are expensive. Yes. And so building really anything new, I mean, I needed a dump. I needed something that was a work in progress. Um, You know, a lot of people don't realize that once again, that $2 million laundromat, I'll just leave it there. Uh, This was an $80,000 laundromat. So it gives you an idea. That was the first thing. And the second thing was I knew that I wasn't in a position to leave my full time job. Um, I knew whatever I did, I would need to at least start as a quote unquote side hustle, a business that I could run on the side. And I didn't want that lifestyle forever, but I was willing to sacrifice for however long it took. I wasn't sure if it would be two years or 20 years. $1,500 a month is not substituting your full-time salary. No, absolutely not. not. Absolutely not. So let's, so let's, let's, let's fast forward a little bit. You get the rest, you get the, uh, sorry, geez, the laundromat uh, up and running. What was one of those, um, early tough lessons learned? that you had to learn the hard way? Hmm. Well, I will say that I'm very fortunate because that mentor I referred to has really kept me <laughs> out of the ditch. Um, mm-hmm. I would have made so many mistakes that are just astronomically expensive and painful that I might not have recovered if I hadn't had a mentor that knew the business really well. Probably my only, I mean, I made some smaller mistakes, but probably, probably my own, only significant mistake and this isn't bragging on me. This is thanks to my mentor um, is that I, you know, I borrowed a lot of money and mm-hmm. I haven't, once again, I have this obsessive personality. And so anything I do, I do at 150 miles an hour and I probably grew a little too fast and I probably borrowed too much money too quickly. Um, but part of the reason I wasn't afraid to do that is I have a reasonable risk tolerance. So I'm not overly you conservative. What you were building. Yeah. I was also very confident, but honestly, I'd been in my job for so long. I was good at my job. That my attitude was always, even if this place breaks, if I borrow $100,000 and put a bunch of new equipment in the store and it grows a little bit because I put new equipment in and it's more profitable, but it really doesn't make any more money than it made before I bought the new equipment, I'm still fine financially. We, The one thing I haven't told you, Adam, is the first four or five years that we were in this journey, this grind, if you will, we didn't take a penny out of the business personally. We lived on our income from our stores, or I'm sorry, from our jobs. Right. And that's well back in. and that that really made me and my wife, who was very conservative financially, that made us both feel very comfortable. We always had the attitude of we don't need anything from the business. We just want to grow it. We want it to be better tomorrow than it was the day before. And so our risk and, tolerance was actually abnormally high for us because we really didn't feel like we had much to lose. So let's go back to the community aspect of it too. So how did mm-hmm. the community react? The good people in the community that you yeah. took over this dump. You fix it up. I mean, listen, people are like doing their laundry and they want to feel safe and they want to feel yep. clean. And there's, you know, elderly people, you know, they don't want to be harassed and, and people who may not or aren't well off. And, you know, they're just going to do their laundry. They're freaking yep. just going to do the laundry. And sometimes they have their kids there with them. Right. And yep. like, it's a community right. part of it. Like, you know, how did the community react and what was that response? And how much did that drive you, Dave, to, to say, hey, listen, mm-hmm. I'm doing something that most people wouldn't even think about as community building, but it's kind of like yep. the barber shop. You know, it's kind of, you know, all those elements of a community. Yeah. I appreciate you bringing that up because to be honest with you, Adam, I mean, I knew that was an aspect of business that was attractive to me, but I was so caught up in the grind of just like not losing money and not bankrupting my family again, by the way, because I'd already been bankrupt in my early 20s um, that I was so caught up in that that I was really more focused on the money 
than the people. And that's not my nature. That's not who I am. I just was borderline mm. desperate. Um, and so what I did is I just did everything I could do to make the experience better for the customers. But selfishly, I was doing it because I wanted to make more money. <clears throat> and what ended up happening was the coolest thing ever, Adam. I've had people to this day and within within four to six weeks of starting to turn this place around, I had multiple people come up to me almost every week with tears in their eyes. Because once again, those nine laundromats in a 20 mile radius were all dumps. And yeah. they could see that I cared. They could see that I was working my tail off. I was working to the bone. They, they knew that I didn't have a lot of money because if I did, I wouldn't have been in there doing it myself at midnight on a school night. Yeah. And, uh, and they, they would just come out to me with tears in their eyes and just say, thank you. And it was always interesting to me because they said, thank you for fixing up our laundromat. Our the, our, the key, the thank key you. Word, the key, thank the key you. word is our yes. laundromat. Because and they, did, most of these people, correct me if I'm wrong, probably didn't have a car to go drive to the one a little bit further down. So they're walking. Mm -hmm. Cincinnati, yeah. Ohio is not Miami Beach. Yep. You have all weather, all seasons. Mm -hmm. And they're yeah, their carts, their shopping carts, they're pulling it, they have a kid, they have strollers. It's This is necessity. It's not a luxury. Yeah. I mean, the, the self-serve laundry business, which is what we're talking about right now, about 60% of our business comes from lower income people. Now, there's a big stigma that only people who use laundromats are poor people, and that's ridiculous. Yeah, go, go, but, to, New York, go to New York right. City in Tribeca, <laughs> right. and I bet you some old buildings there that don't have laundry machines, right? Right. So that's not true, um, although it is moderately accurate. That's what I'll say. Um, and so what ended up happening is I realized that I was changing people's lives. And that really struck a chord with me and my heart. It really did because it wasn't why I was doing this. It wasn't a focus of mine, but it was another aha moment where I was like, you know what? I can have my cake and eat it too because I want to impact people's lives. That's, that's my heart. That's the person I am. But I was so focused on just making a living for my family and maybe someday quitting my job that I hated um, that I, that was the, my only focus. And when those two things kind of came into focus for me and I realized that I not only could do both, but they were both feeding each other. It was, it was this circle of life mentality of if I take care of people and if I serve my community and I elevate my community and I serve these underprivileged people and people that are used to being taken advantage of by society in a lot of ways, if I serve them in a very sincere way, they will just throw their wallets at me. Yeah. This is, this and I was like, and not that they had a lot of money in their wallets because <laughs> no, they but, didn't, but they had to do laundry somewhere. And so what they would do is they would tell their friends and right. they would tell their friends and they would tell their friends. And so I just built up this amazing appreciation <laughs> for, for my community, which I'd grown up since sixth grade at this point, And they uh, returned the favor. That's they big. were so grateful that they helped me spread the word. and. Within a, within a seven or eight month period of time, this business was profiting. Even after borrowing a bunch of debt and servicing the debt, um, this store was easily cash flowing four or $5,000 a wow. month. Wow. And, and that was, that was significant big. money to me. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's, so, so when, 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 when in the timeline did you say, all right, time for us to expand and invest mm -hmm. into a second operation? Yep. And, and just for everyone's kind of a uh, point of reference, uh, as of today, early October 2021, how many stores do you have? Uh, we have four laundromats in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, we've invested in some real estate, so we've purchased a couple of the buildings that our stores are in now. Um, and uh, and we have some some other investments that are um, vertically Percolated. integrated. Vert right. vertically integrated, you know, meaning drop off laundry services. We're now fully attended. We have store managers. Uh, we have a robust pickup and delivery business where we offer a pickup and delivery laundry service throughout mm -hmm. the entire greater Cincinnati area. Um, awesome. So yeah, we've, yeah. we've, we've expanded. We've expanded. Sure. So, so doubling back <laughs> here, when did, when did the, when did the uh, wheel start churning for second operation? Uh, right around the time of that conversation. <laughs> yeah. As soon as I realized what I had You're hit on something. and I, and I, once again, because I had studied business for so long, I knew I was onto something. The only thing that I felt like could stop me were the laws of mm -hmm. supply and demand. And once again, within a 20 mile radius, by the way, this, I didn't mention this first store I bought was about two miles from my home. So it was in the community I lived in. Mm -hmm. And I knew that all nine laundromats in a 20 mile radius were dumps. 
Well, an opportunity. everybody wasn't going to come from 20, 30 minutes away to no. use my laundromat. Especially if they're and not so, doing transportation. No one's getting on correct. the bus with all their laundry. Correct. And so that was when I really had my moment. That's when it really went from like, this can be a nice little side business that can take care of my family, but maybe I'll never quit my job to, I can really make a go of this. And at that point, my ceiling um, for my businesses was very simple. I thought, wow, if I get, if I get one or two more of these, I can quit my job and basically just be self-employed and only work for myself. And that sounded like a dream life for me. And so the crazy thing is within, within 12 months of buying my first store, we got, we acquired our second store and I didn't say buy because it was a rundown dumpy laundromat that was actually closed. It was so bad that the health department had closed it. It was about 20 miles away from this store, but I had a one hour commute to my job every day. And this store was right off the highway, right off the exit, 20 minutes North of, of my home, meaning it was on my way to work and on my way home from work. And it was in a shopping center. And long story short, I approached the property owners and I said, you know, you kind of, I said it professionally, of course, but I said, you kind of have a cesspool on your hands here. And they knew they did um, because they had a mess to clean up. And I said, look, I'm in the laundry business, which I didn't tell them I had only been in it for eight months. I said, I'm in the laundry business. This is what I do. I own a store over, it sits over in Amelia, which is the suburb. And I said, you know, I, this is what I do. I buy rundown dumpy laundromats. I fix them up and make them really nice community assets. I take them, my, my pitch to them was I take them from community, community eyesores and I turn them into community assets. And that's what I would like to do with this space. And I basically through negotiation, which I was pretty good at through negotiation, I convinced them to, to invest in me. And wow. so they gave it to me. They handed it to me. Uh, they handed me the keys and everything, signed me to a long-term lease. And I didn't pay any rent for nine months. They gave me about twenty thousand dollars in ten I TI money. So they became like partners. Improvement. Yep, that's right. They invested in me. They believed in and you. I, they saw the, yep. the opportunity as well. They knew it. That's right. It was a smart investment on their part. It wasn't an emotional. Right, because it, it also it also ups the the value of the other stores in that shopping center Absolutely. and it makes it more attractive because you have better clientele. I mean, you have a you're taking away. You know, it, it's a cur- not just a curb appeal, right? That there's I don't know what else is in that shopping center, but people may not want to go there because there's run down dump over there. Yeah. It's well, a, you mentioned it earlier, a laundromat that's either closed or almost closed is just a, is just an opportunity for the bad guys to hang out <laughs> is what it is. So, and they were hanging out. They were yeah. on the sidewalk, the whole nine yard, and there was nobody there to run them off. Yeah. Let's, I want to spend a minute just real quick too about laundromat tax and it doesn't really go into it, but like really mm-hmm. kind of gives like a high level overview, the evolution of laundry machines. I know, I mean, for us personally, a couple of years ago, I converted to gas and I had to get a new dryer and I'm like. Shit, my dryer has got Wi-Fi now. It's telling me when things are upgraded, but that's mm-hmm. residential. I mean, we're talking yep. about, you know, high volume commercial, you know, machines here. You're talking about like water quality. You're talking about payment. You're talking about, you know, cleaning it when someone's putting bleach in. You're like, shit, someone else is putting something in right afterwards. It doesn't want, I mean, so many things that none of us even think about. Hard water, soft water, detergents, filtration. I mean, I can't even imagine the drainage coming out of these places. Talk to mm-hmm. us a little bit about you know, your learning curve as well as the evolution of laundry tech real quick. I'm yeah, fascinated well, by this shit, right? Like I watch yeah. the Discovery Channel. These are things that not many people <laughs> are interested in. So this is what I'm yeah. me, folks listening. Yeah, no, no problem at all. So the one thing I, I, once again, at this point, I was still learning. I won't, I won't deny that at all. I was by no means an expert in the laundromat business, but I knew enough to know that there was a tremendous amount of value in the infrastructure because this business is very capital intensive. You know, if you if you're gonna open a, a clothing business, store, right? that's right, this that's right. Plumbing. If you're if you're gonna open a clothing store, you just throw up a few retail racks and some shirts and a cash register, right. and you're good to go. I mean, there's probably one hundred fifty thousand dollars in infrastructure value alone in this rundown dumpy laundromat, and then there was equipment in there. Eighty percent of it was garbage. We ripped it out and scrapped it, but that meant twenty percent of it we could use, and we cleaned it up and we painted it and made it look nicer. And then we borrowed a whole bunch of money to buy a whole bunch of new equipment. Mm. Um, and that's that's how we turned the place around was, yeah, the, the water lines, the gas lines, the electric lines, the the, the electric service panels in that facility. You mentioned yeah. the drain. The, these have about the power inch. supplies. I mean, I have a 220 yep. just on one dryer. How much, yep. how much was the electric bills in these places that you had to cover, right? Yep, absolutely. Electric bill in a laundromat and a very small laundromat is 1000 maybe $1,500 a month. And in these high end facilities that are monsters, I mean, it can be five, six, eight, ten thousand dollars a month. Right. That's, that's a fixed cost, my friend. Yep. Absolutely. You're paying that um, no matter what. Otherwise, the electric company is shutting your power off. That's yeah, like the first the, bill you the pay good, after, before rent, right? <laughs> that's right. The good, the good thing about and the, the water bill business. Too. 
Yes, the water right. bills. Yeah. I'm going to throw utilities all into one right. bucket. And as a general rule, we have, you know, some people that, that run kind of what I call a commodity mindset laundromat, which is not service-based, um, but people that run that type of a business, um, they say all the time, we're in the business of reselling utilities. That's what we do. We buy utilities, we mark them up, uh -huh. and we resell them. Now, obviously, you have to buy equipment and pay rent and stuff, but that's the idea. And as a general rule, your utilities on a modernized laundromat will be about 15% of gross revenue. On an older, rundown, dumpy laundromat with very inefficient equipment, it can be as high as 30, 35, or even 40%, yeah. which you're not going to make much money if your utilities are that expensive. I mean, that's another business lesson there. Investing in better quality, more efficient equipment. If you're thinking about yep. more higher efficient dryers for electric, higher efficient mm -hmm. water, less water usage, the ROI, I mean, it's a, it's an equation. Yeah, I actually, I write a, I write a, uh, bi-monthly column for planet laundry magazine which is our, one of our industry magazines oh my god i'm a subscriber um, too next. <laughs> and it's my uh, favorite, I just, <laughs> favorite newsletter dave get it every month uh but uh yeah i just wrote an article uh, last month that came out in the uh, i think it was the september issue of the magazine and it was talking to laundromat owners and basically describing for them how by the time you take into effect uh, you know, depreciation, amortization of this equipment, mm -hmm. the tax write-offs mm -hmm. and benefits, and then the utility savings between having a 30 to 35 or 40 percent utilities as a percentage of gross revenue versus 15 percent of gross revenue that the equipment essentially pays for itself. If you have an old rundown dumpy laundromat, you can you can leverage, you can borrow usually anywhere from 80, 90 up to 100 percent of the cost of replacing all of your equipment. And it will essentially pay for itself. And so the title of the article was free equipment. Well, that'll that'll get people's attention. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you've expanded vertical integration is something that 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 I understand there, too. But let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know, you study business and you're like, all right, well, we mastered. Well, I'm going to say master. We have a good handle on the self-service element. When did you start to layer in the drop, the drop off, the managed locations and eventually up to pick up and deliver? Yeah, what ended up happening was we bought that second store. We got it very profitable within three weeks of opening the store, which was absolutely amazing for us. And we had two local laundromats in Cincinnati, Ohio, that were uh, each probably making three to five thousand dollars a month. And that would have been enough for me to quit my job, just barely, uh, but it would have been enough. And we decided to practice what I call keeping your hand out of the cookie jar. The fancy mm -hmm. term is delayed gratification. More of the same. And so I told my wife, I said, you know what? We're just going to keep reinvesting every penny these businesses make back into the businesses. We're going to keep our hand out of the cookie jar and not touch any of the money for yeah. the next three years. And so we're one year in for the next three years. We arrive at year four in our journey. And that was when we had the opportunity to acquire our third store. And it was open. It was a laundromat that was open to the public. It was in pretty, pretty bad shape, but not as bad as the first two. At this point, I knew the business really, really well from a self-serve perspective. And this store was more of a, it wasn't well run, but it was more of a full service laundromat, meaning it was fully attended, washing had a wash dry fold service in it, those types of things. And I was buying it either way. Um, but I had to, I had a pivotal decision to make. Should I invest in that side of the business and learn that business? You know, or should I, you know, shut it, not shut it down, but shut down the wash dry fold, continue my unattended business model with this third location. And I made the right decision, but it was, it was not, it was not easy. Um, you're dealing, at this you're dealing point, with people more, right? You're dealing with service yeah, versus service. That's right. Right. Well, and what I've always been passionate about in anything I do in life is being the best. And I'm not comparing myself to other people. I'm comparing myself to the top of the industry, whatever that looks like. I don't want to be average or below average. I want to be among the best in whatever I do. And so what I did is I said, you know, the top of the industry are full service laundries. They're attended. And while you can run a nice unattended laundromat, the one thing an unattended laundromat can never be is a full service laundromat, meaning you can't provide the same level of service if you don't have a staff on duty. You can't keep it as clean. You can't keep it as safe. And I recognized that. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take a business that at this point I've been in for almost five years and I'm going to take this business model. I'm going to kind of turn it on its head. And so now I had this whole new part of the industry that I had to dive in and learn. Mm -hmm. And I did. And I, I rinsed and repeated, quote, you know, put and pun intended. intended. Right. And I took that back to my first and my second business model and I made them fully Good attended point. and I offered dropper laundry services there. And I started to hire management to help me with mm -hmm. training and things like that. So the profit margin closed on that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The nice thing about a self-serve laundromat business is all your expenses are paid. Now, your utilities are a percentage of your business. So if you start doing all kinds of drop-off laundry volume, your utilities only go up as a percentage of the revenue. And if you don't do a lot of drop-off, then your utilities don't go up. But your rent doesn't go up. 
You don't have to buy more machines. If you want to be fully attended, your staff that's there can typically keep up with most of the volume unless you really explode. And so I was like, there's a whole new revenue stream here associated with this full service business model, which is a part of the industry that I was gravitated towards anyways. And this this was what the top operators in the industry were doing. Right. And that was what I wanted to do. But Dave, now you became a people manager. Was that a challenge for you mm-hmm. or something that you Not naturally, like you were a natural people leader? So, yep. but this is Absolutely. different than, right? Like these are, the folks that work in a larger matter are different than folks that work in corporate America. Yep. No and doubt I mean that from a, from a skill set perspective. And I'm talking mm-hmm. about what kind of big humans they are, right? We're just talking yep. straight up. Like someone who manages, you know, works on a larger mat, you know, eight hours a day is different than someone who's in finance, right? Mm-hmm. It's just a different, a different Absolutely. But you, what were some of those pieces that you learned from your time in corporate America as far as people leadership that you applied when hiring, building, and managing a team? Well, what I did is a few things. I just used good old-fashioned common sense because I had grown up in pretty extreme poverty, and so I had been mistreated. I had been one of those people that was mistreated by society. And people, that, a lot of people that use a laundromat are those people, but a lot of the entry-level employees, at least, that work in a laundromat are also those people. A lot of times they're customers of ours Mm -hmm. that end up becoming employees. They need jobs. I had grown up that way. Not, I mean, I never lost sight of the fact that that's who I was. That's my whole family. Mm -hmm. Um, That's who we were. And so I knew that most of those people in that economic demographic were good people. They weren't bad people. They just didn't have a lot of money. There's a difference. Now, there's always a few that are robbing banks and convenience stores, but generally speaking, these are good people who just don't have a lot of money. And so I knew that and I just treated people like people. I was just like, you're What's like you're a human being. It's not rocket science here. People Good just want to be treated. Families. I mean, yeah, I mean, right, exactly. And so I did everything I could to help them in any way that I can, whether it was, okay, if you're going to work here, we're not going to pay you minimum wage. We're going to pay you $3 above minimum wage. And we're going to, of course, build it into our cost. You know, our prices are going to be a little bit higher, but we're going to provide a high level of service, but the expectation is going to be there. And if your car breaks down and you can't afford a new battery, I'm gonna, just going to go buy you a battery because it just seems like the right thing to do to me. It's, you it's, take care of me and my customers and my business, and I'm going to do the same for you. And this so just simple. wasn't, so this just wasn't rocket science for me. No, it's just how you, it's just how you treat people here. Yeah. So I want, I want to kind of close the conversation on, on the, on the business before we get to the book and bring this home here. You know, mm-hmm. is it, would you recommend someone looking to invest uh, an entrepreneur instead of, you know, maybe some of these tech stuff, if someone has the right fortitude and background, mm-hmm. it's not for everybody. This is no. a hands-on, in Absolutely. the trenches, nitty gritty type of business. It's not for everybody. Yep. Was it still one of the best businesses in America? Small businesses? Yep. Absolutely. If you're the person that doesn't shy away from or even are, you know, there's this old, this cliche of I'm a people person, right? I hate that. Well, I, yeah, sometimes <laughs> people associate it with being introverted or extroverted or whatever. I don't know all that. All I know is like, I, I don't, I enjoy people. I always say I can't have too many friends. Like, I want to meet everybody. I want to know everybody, unless you're just a real dirtbag. Then I don't want to know you. <laughs> but generally speaking, I want to meet everybody. I want to know everybody. And if I find myself in a position to impact your life, I want to do that. If you find yourself as that type of person, meaning that people are important to you, managing people is just about treating them with some dignity and caring about them. Just it's not it rocket science. But that's not for everybody. And that doesn't make you a bad person. I'm not some, saying you're a I, terrible I say all the time. Some people are meant to lead people, and that's fine. Yes. You're an individual contributor. That's fine. Not everyone yep. has that people leadership skill set, and that's Absolutely. okay. I Absolutely. mean, some people in corporate America, you've seen this. The only way to promote people is to give them people underneath them to lead, and that's where a lot mm. of people fail. Yes. Early on in my career, they put people underneath me, and I wasn't Great set point. up for success on how to lead people. But I was yep. a great individual contributor. It wasn't until now, you mm-hmm. know, 20 years in, 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 in my career that I have that skill set. But it comes down. It's so simple. Dude. Just it treat, is. It's a golden rule. Just treat people with empathy and care yep. and give a shit yep. and lead by example. Like that's really how you lead people. And don't lie to them. Just tell them the truth. If they, if, they, if they do a great job and you want to give them a raise and you just it's not in the budget, you just can't afford it, then just tell them you can't afford it. But let me tell you something. If you can't afford it, and they're what I call a rock star employee, and they deserve a raise, then don't hold back just because you want a Beamer. Like, take care of your people. Treat them take the right care way. Of you. Yes, because yeah. they'll know if you can afford and, it or if you can't afford and it. And you can't have a business without them. No, absolutely not. I couldn't have absolutely a business not. without the people that work for me. I would just yep. be me, right? Yep. It would just be me doing everything. And, and it's such a simple concept. So let's talk about the book, um, mm-hmm. Laundromat Millionaire. It's a pretty easy title there. Um, what was the impetus to write this, man? This book was seven years in the making, Adam, and it actually started well before I was a millionaire. 
And I had been through a lot of adversity in my life. Um, lost my sister to brain cancer when she was 14 and I was 19. Lost my brother to drug addiction. Those were my two siblings. And my brother was one of my best friends. Um, had been through just a lot of adversity in her life and poverty and things like that. And I just felt that I had a story on my heart that I wanted to write. And so I started writing, honestly, just kind of a biography, kind of a life story. And this is seven, eight years ago. So this is roughly five years into my journey. I was not a millionaire, not even close. And I just felt like I had a story to tell the world. So I started writing this book. Long story short, I've rewritten the same book seven times over a seven-year period of time. And every time I've changed the intentionality of the story yeah. and the life lessons in my life that I want to get out into the world and associated them with treating people the right way, treating people with respect, elevating your communities around you and elevating what I call my industry, the laundromat industry, because the laundromat industry has a very negative connotation associated with it. Right. You say the word laundromat, most people don't think of a nice laundromat. They don't think no, of a modernized laundromat. They think, they think laundromat. of the, they think of the ghettos, you know, <laughs> that's, that's right. what they think about. And so I become, you know, now, <clears throat> long story short, what ended up happening around year 10 is me and my wife woke up one day, we were updating our personal financial statement. And I looked at her and was like, wow, do you realize we're millionaires? And she Once was you like, see that number, that, that, yeah. that comma. And, go she, one over. and she was like, what? Pretty what? Cool. I said, yeah, look at this. We're like, our net worth is over a million dollars. And she was like, hmm. she handed me the paper back and went back to typing on her computer. And I was like, I don't know what to make of that. She goes. I don't feel like a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, who's, 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 who's the book in the podcast for? Who's your content for? The, the book in the podcast is for uh, almost everyone. And I know that's cliche, but primarily who it's for is the 10 year old Dave Menz, hmm. who everybody told I couldn't do anything in my life because I wasn't good at school and my family didn't have a famous name. And I wasn't the smartest and I was even stubborn and didn't listen real well. And everybody told me that I'd never amount to anything in life. It's for them. It's for those people. And let me tell you something. Sometimes those people still exist at 50 years old or 40 years old or 30 years old. I happen to be 10. <clears throat> and so it's for them. It's for them. It has nothing to do with business. It has to do with life. And so my hope is that they get the life stories and journeys and that the overcoming obstacles and the stubborn obstinance that can drive you forward and you can accomplish anything in life, that inspirational aspect to my story that is there. And I want people to feel, <clears throat> but it's also, <clears throat> excuse me, it's also for entrepreneurs and business owners, people that are, I either are business owners and entrepreneurs and maybe aren't thriving because I see a lot of this in my industry of people that quote unquote own commodity laundromats. And have never evolved in anything else. They just are operating at the bottom of the industry. They think that is the industry. They don't even know there's another part, part to the industry. And so I want to get the message out to them, people in my industry. I want to elevate my industry by show, sharing my story with these people and saying, you can do what I did. What I did, I'm not special. Um, that you can do it. And here's, here's the path to do so. And then I'm trying to create other resources around the book as too, like coaching courses and yeah. e-courses and my podcast and things like that to help elevate the industry as well. Yeah, but man. the last thing that I want to get in there, if it's okay, Adam, is I want this message to go to the people that are not in business for themselves that have always wanted to, and they're scared. Because a lot of times there's entrepreneurs and business owners out there in the world that the only thing they're fully capable, they're meant to do this just like I was. And the only thing stopping them is fear. Well, I want them to see my story because I didn't grow up with a silver spoon. I had most disadvantages in life, I'll say. And, and I overcame that fear. And how I overcame that fear is real simple. Education. Education. And for a guy and, that didn't go to college. Control. And taking yes. control and not making excuses, not blaming other people mm -hmm. and do it yourself. Dave, this is a great story, man. Let's 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 bring it home here. Um, what is what is the single greatest piece of advice that you've ever received that you take action on every single day of your life? Mm. You know, the best piece of advice I've ever gotten is from a mentor of mine in a church I grew up in, and they said, "You know what, Dave? Life isn't that hard. Just always do the right thing." It's usually pretty obvious. That's what they told me. They said, it's usually pretty obvious what the right thing is. The difference is that sounds really easy, but the, the right thing is almost always hard too. Yeah. 
It's hard. And and I carry that with me. I carry that with me as my guiding light to this day. And it's also a part of this book story that I want to tell is I've always done the right thing. I've never cut corners. I've never used others. I've never, never manipulated others. Every penny that I've earned in my life has been in, it has been as a result of servitude to others. I love it. And so I want people to know that we can have our cake and eat it too. We can. And cake is cake is good. I love cake. Um, <laughs> Dave, what's 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 your superpower, man? Like, I mean, I, I I have my own kind of sense here from this, you know, fifty-two minute conversation. But what is your superpower, mm-hmm. man? What do you do better than almost anywhere in this universe that makes you special? Who you are? Um, I don't quit. That's it. I've said all along. I don't really have too many superpowers. I'm certainly not the smartest guy in the world. Clearly, not the good, most good looking. Don't have really much a whole lot going for me. But the reality is. I won't quit. Like you got to kill me. That's it. That's the only way I'm going to stop coming. And it has really fed me well in life. Um, and and so that's another message that I want to get out to people is just don't give up. You know, the old, the old football cliche, I can't remember what coach it was Landry, maybe, uh, you know, they said something about it, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down, you just keep getting back up. Maybe it was Lombardi or something. Um, I mean, it's really that simple. It really is. Just keep going. And, and, and Dave, last, last but not least, right. I mean, your journey is incredible and you've been down in the deepest, darkest places. You know, think about, you know, the times in your life that you've experienced great loss, your sibling, mm-hmm. growing up in poverty and having to pull yourself up and really, literally, figuratively, metaphorically being in the shit pit of life. Yeah. And you pulled yourself up and you took ownership. You had to dig down deep inside and harness that inner tenacity that I see through this camera right now, man. And on the flip side, you're sitting here talking about the businesses that you're building that are helping communities, you're making a difference and you have your wife, you have your kids, you have your family. How do you stay focused? What is your compass? Dave Menz, laundromat millionaire. What is your North star in life? My North star is is God. And I know not everybody has faith and I'm not here to pound anything into anybody else, but the reality is that's my North star. When at times in my life, when I didn't follow the things that God recommended that I do, and by the way, he doesn't make us do anything. He recommends them. Um, and we are, we are, you know, we can choose to follow his guidance or not with the times in my life where I have not listened to God have not ended well. The times in life where I have listened to God have resulted in one of the most amazing lives that a human being, at least Dave men's human being, we all have different standards could ever live. I have an amazing wife. I have an amazing marriage. I have amazing children who we're teaching to serve the world. Um, these things are exponential. And so it's really not any more than that for me. This is a story, people. I want, I want everybody to, to really, this is, this is a good one. And I appreciate your vulnerability. I appreciate you opening up and, and sharing. And I feel like I know you, man. I mean, I, I really do. I feel like we were meant to be connected. And that's really what this Absolutely. show is about, man. Like, conversations and, and, and sharing and you're on a mission. I, I love I it. I applaud you. I want everyone out there to connect with Dave at the laundromat By the time the show comes out in a few weeks, the book will be out. Where can people find the book? Where can they connect with you? Where can they learn more, Dave? Yeah, they can just go to my website, laundromatmillionaire.com. They can pre-order the book there, as you mentioned. Um, you know, I'm on social media. Obviously, that's how we connected through LinkedIn, which I'm very appreciative of you reaching out. Um, I'm on oh. Facebook and Instagram. Um, and so those are, those are the best ways to reach me is the website and those three, uh, those three platforms. I love it, David. I can't wait to get that book in my hands and, and put it on my shelf next to my other podcast guests and, and spend some time going through it. Dave, um, I appreciate you, brother. I really do. Thank you. Keep doing what I you appreciate can. you. Thank you. Thank you so here. much, Adam. Hang with me for a moment here. And everyone listening, I mean, this is what the show is all about. I mean, if podcast is anything, this is it. This is the show, guys. You know where to find out more? Find us at thepodcast.com. Follow us on all the social media channels. Remember, if you like this episode, leave a review rating. It goes a long way and it really makes a difference. I appreciate everyone. Look out for one another. Take care of each other and catch us next week. For another great episode of the podcast. Take care, everybody. Wisdom is forever. But for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon. Jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.